Hi folks, um, my name is Philip. I am working at a project called Centrifuge and I'm delighted to tell you a little bit about what we do with um, bringing off-chain or real-world assets um, into the DeFi space using NFTs um, and ZK Snarks to keep some things private that we don't want to show uh, on-chain. Before, though, diving into content, like anything we do, we work on, we tie back to the mission for Centrifuge, and that is um, changing the rules of global trade uh, to foster economic opportunity. And so um, you'll see kind of keeping that in mind as we go through the, through the storyline, like why do we actually build this thing? Why do we want to bring off-chain assets uh, on-chain? So um, this talk will be about tokenizing off-chain assets with Centrifuge. So that's one component. Uh, using ZK Snarks for NFT minting, um, that's the other part. And then lastly, to get on-chain funding. So DeFi for us is really getting funding uh, where we use these off-chain assets as collateral. So those are the three main components. But uh, like, why do we even want to bring real-world or off-chain assets uh, on-chain? Right. So that. Like, why even go through that hassle? Like, why can't we not just have everything in crypto? Um, the reality for us is that there are uh, many things that just live off chain that have real value um, and that want to want to be financed. I'll give you three examples. Uh, one thing uh, when we talk about an off chain asset is actually an unpaid invoice. If you are a business, you want to get paid. You're going to get money from your customers, and a lot of these invoices have payment terms that are 45, 90, 180 days out. Right, so you have this asset that's kind of locked. You, you cannot get the cash and you want money right now as a business. Um, another example is uh, we're working with some real estate lenders who are underwriting mortgages and giving out mortgages. And they are looking to tap into uh, different sources of capital or cheaper sources of capital. Right? If you're a lender, you're getting your money from somewhere to, for the mortgages you give out. Um, if that one lender disappears, you cannot run your business anymore, like underwriting loans and, and giving out um, those loans. So they are looking for alternative sources of capital uh, that they can up tap into. And the last thing, uh, as another example, is we're working with some with a platform that works with artists. Uh, when you have a hit song as an artist, you want to pour money into marketing to like, continue riding that wave of a of this hit song. Um, but the royalty payments come in way way later. Like as an example, uh, until recently, it could take up to two years to get your royalty payments um, from Spotify streaming, and that sucks. So there are all these kind of different types of off-chain assets that uh, really could benefit from liquidity. And those three use cases are actually something that uh, we have been working on with uh, some project projects. So you might not have heard about Centrifuge in general. Um, before going into the detail and the flow, so Centrifuge, um, has a component for um, exchanging financial documents in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion in a private, secure, and verifiable way. So uh, you can send documents around like invoices um, and have an unalterable single source of truth. And that becomes important uh, when we talk about tokenization later. You want to only be able to tokenize one thing once. Um, and then you can, of course, tokenize these documents and access the Ethereum DeFi ecosystem through something we call Tin Lake. It's basically a way to take NFTs and turn them into your C20s. Um, I'm going to talk about that uh, later on. But let's walk through, through an actual use case um, of an invoice. So if you have two companies, they do business in the old or traditional way, right? So uh, tire LLCs selling tires to the big car manufacturer. And at some point, they want to get paid. So they send an invoice um, through Centrifuge. There's this peer-to-peer -peer network. We're using the P2P for the peer-to-peer -peer, um, interactions. And an invoice is nothing else than a structured set of data that's being sent around. So Tire LLC on one side is preparing the message, assigning and sending it over to Bitcar, who um, receives the, the invoice, verifies the signatures, um, and basically does their approval of an invoice, sends back a message, and it goes back and forth, and they're kind of attaching signatures to that, kind of like a state channel, if you want. But at some point, um, they want to actually uh, publish um, the unalterable part of, of that single source of truth. So the other layer of Centrifuge is Ethereum, where we have three components. The first one is actually to find each other on that um, peer-to-peer layer. Uh, each of the participants publishes their public key and something we call PIV, the peer-to-peer -peer node identity contract. 
Um, so you can look up participants and on the other side, of course, verify the signatures of messages that um, have been received. And during that um, exchange that I mentioned earlier, at some point you want to kind of publish or notarize this invoice status. So we call them anchors. So each participant can at any point in time publish an anchor, um, which is basically a root hash of the document data um, on Ethereum to have an unalterable source of truth, which comes then into play later on when you want to mint the token or an NFT or the knowledge enabled NFT based on the data that has been exchanged. These NFTs um, go into what we call Tin Lake uh, to turn them into ERC-20s because the whole DeFi ecosystem only understands ERC-20 today. You cannot take an NFT and put it onto Compound, for example, or uh, even with multi-collateral DAI, you cannot put an NFT in there. They only understand ERC-20s. So Tin Lake is a way to pool uh, these NFTs, uh, issue ERC-20s, correlating to the value of that pool, and then do something with that. So that's kind of the overarching system, and I'm gonna walk you through um, the NFT minting and the zero knowledge parts next. So high level, how this works is that an invoice or a mortgage or whatever kind of document that exists on the peer-to-peer -peer layer is basically just a set of fields, uh, line items, like nested uh, field structures. And what Centrifuge does, it takes these and turns every single data field into a leaf of a Merkle tree. And that root hash is what's getting committed onto Ethereum. So that allows you to do pretty cool things like providing only Merkle proofs to validate specific fields of, of a document or also then for, for zero knowledge proofs. So the journey from, like, from the off-chain document or the off-chain asset to financing is you have this off-chain document on the one side then you mint, or the user mints uh, an NFT, in this case, uh, an unpaid invoice NFT, right? So you see the amount and so on, but way less information is being revealed than what you have on the off-chain um, data set. That gets put into Din Lake, moving on into um, Maker, Compound, and others. But there's one problem here, is that you don't want to lay open the amounts of your invoices. You don't want to necessarily lay open who are actually the customers that you interact with the, when you want to seek financing. So that's um, where zero knowledge proofs come in. Basically what we did is we turned the, um, this unpaid invoice NFT with, with only some fields revealed into a zero knowledge NFT where you provide a proof to mint and you provide a proof to um, assure that the value of the NFT is lower than the value of the off-chain asset. So you can only um, lend up to the amount of the off-chain asset, and replacing the customer basically with the credit score of a customer. So you can prove that a customer is in a set of, um, you know, kind of a list, and you can publish the credit score, which can then be used for underwriting without actually revealing the actual customer that, that was there. I think most of you have heard of ZK Snarks at this point, but just briefly. So ZK Snark, uh, zero knowledge proofs, allow to demonstrate stuff about something without giving away any, uh, any information. They are easy to verify and really hard to fake, impossible to fake. Like one simple example for zero knowledge proof is that you can prove that you know the pre-image of a hash but only reveal the hash, right? So instead of the pre-image itself. Whoops, one too many. For our um, zero knowledge portion, we worked, uh, we used Zocrates. So to generate the, the circuits and generating the proofs. Zocrates is a really cool tool where you have a DSL um, to construct snarks. So you see it's like normal programming language there instead of like generate like manually creating a circuit. Um, and we closely work with Stefan, uh, who is one of the contributors to Zocrates to help us implement the zero knowledge NFT minting and the verification on Ethereum. So hat tip to Stefan. So how does our zero knowledge NFT actually work? So the public inputs for the verification is that credit rating that I mentioned earlier, right? You want to prove that this NFT went to a customer that uh, has a certain credit rating. Um, the amount of the NFT, so that the amount uh, that we compare against the invoice amount. And then some root hashes that are being used to kind of verify proofs. Um, privately, we have the document tree, so remember that 
off-chain invoice uh, where you have the amount and you also have the signatures that have been attached like when this ping pong happened between um, Tayo LLC and Bicar. And on the other side, we instead of having just the customer, we have something we call a company rating tree where somebody publishes the rating of the public key from company one, two, three, four, five to a rating. And later on, you can basically find that rating tree and compare it uh, against that root hash that has been uh, passed. And the SNARK, what it does, it um, verifies that the Merkle proof uh, for the company rating tree and the key matches, so finding and making sure that the public key of the customer is actually the one that's on the rating tree. It verifies the signature um, of the customer. And then, of course, it also verifies that the invoice amount is larger than the amount that should be uh, represented in the NFT. So that's the snark uh, that has been generated. To implement that, we had to change a couple of things um, on Centrifuge on the peer-to-peer -peer layer. So before uh, enabling zero-knowledge minting, uh, we used Kekak uh, for hashing. That's really costly uh, when you do that uh, in zero-knowledge, so we changed it to Peterson. Um, also, the signature verification scheme we had to change. And um, also there, Stefan helped. He implemented baby job job as the elliptic curve that's underlying for the hashing and uh, the signature verification. So that's, kind of, that's how we construct the NFT, basically um, publishing only uh, the rating and the amount uh, of the NFT instead of the invoice. So we have this wonderful NFT now. A lot of stuff is private. What do you do with that? How do you get that into DeFi? So that's where uh, what we call Tin Lake comes into play. Um, so off-chain assets are often quite unique, right? Invoices, each of them is unique, but similar in some sense. Uh, these mortgages are very unique, uh, very unique customer and very unique asset that's been underwritten. Um, as I mentioned, DeFi can't talk ESC 721 today. Uh, you cannot put that into any kind of lending pool or whatever, but everyone understands ESC 20. So we, we built Tin Lake because we only do NFTs and nobody understands NFTs. So we built Tin Lake uh, as a framework to underwrite um, assets to set the value of these assets. So uh, like the mortgage company is underwriting and setting the value of each of these mortgages to deposit NFTs. So in, uh, in this case, an invoice or a mortgage. It could also be a crypto kitty or any kind of other NFT. It doesn't have to be a centrifuge NFT. And then draw a currency from somewhere. Um, and basically you fractionalize a large asset or you create a pool of assets uh, that kind of from the similar asset class. So how that flow works is, so where do we have this NFT? It might or might not have some zero knowledge things in it. Um, you have a borrower, uh, remember the three examples, that could be an artist, that could be the mortgage company, that could be a company with an invoice that's outstanding. And they deposit this NFT into a Tin Lake pool. Um, these pools are unique for the asset class. So there's one pool for invoices, one pool for mortgages, et cetera, et cetera, because um, yeah, it makes it easier to underwrite. Uh, and then from this pool of NFTs, we generate something we call collateral value tokens that represent the value of that pool. And that's then getting pushed into Maker, Compound, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you want to um, use as a lending facility. Usually there's an, a stable coin that comes out of it. So far we have been using DAI. Uh, that's getting them passed on to the borrower. And there are some mechanisms in there that the Tin Lake operator can um, receive some value for the underwriting um, and so on, but just keeping that very high level here right now. So to sum up, um, the building blocks that we have, we have the Centrifuge Peer-to-Peer -peer, uh, exchange. We have the ZK, uh, ZK proof generation with Socrates um, that are getting verified on, um, on Ethereum. The minting uh, through our contracts. And lastly, Tin Lake as the actual system to bring these NFTs into, into the DeFi space. Where we are today, so Center Future has been live on Mainnet since May, roughly. Uh, we presented at ZCon 1, like our minting, like much more in detail on the zero knowledge side. So my, my colleague Lucas and Stefan Demmel presented it there. Uh, Tin Lake is live since July. Uh, we financed the first 200,000 DAI together with Maker Foundation. So we have been collaborating closely with them because, of course, they want to get all kinds of assets into multi collateral DAI that are not only crypto. And uh, we roughly have one new asset provider or asset producer 
coming live right now, going through that first like run through Tin Lake. And um, we're working, of course, on multi-collateral die, compound, other lending products, like getting these CVTs in there. Uh, also working with some, some traditional funders who just have a bunch of cash that they want to deploy and lend out and use Tin Lake for better tracking of uh, the underwriting process. And then also some decentralized underwriting. Right, what I mentioned earlier, right now there's one pool operator. Um, you can imagine that there's many people underwriting an asset or staking towards an asset, participating in, in the, uh, the win or the loss on each of these assets. So you can decentralize the underwriting itself and, uh, and some more uh, from there. So that's, that's what we do. I will bring these real-world assets into DeFi. And we have about four minutes for some questions. So if you have some, I'd be super happy to answer them. Yeah. So today, who is um, liquidating the CFT, CVTs and the Yeah, so the question was uh, who is um, liquidating the CVTs or who is providing, who is taking them basically and giving DAI for that? Yeah. So in this, in this first case, we have basically a simulation of MCD where there is just a contract that the DAI gets deposited into and that allows to draw, like allows the compound pool to draw from there. So everything else is uh, working as I just described with, like basically we have different adapters that we're provide that we're writing for the um, DAI or USDC or whatever providing. And in this case, it's just a contract uh, that we mocked out, uh, MCD and so on. What do you mean by, you said multi-collateral DAI, but not only crypto, what do you mean by um, what, I, what I meant earlier is that multi-collateral DAI is gonna support a bunch of different collateral types, right? bunch of ESC 20s um, and I don't want to speak too much for the maker folks because they can do that much better but if uh, if you look at all of the crypto assets today all the different ESC 20 tokens that exist they're really correlating like when everything goes down they go down these kind of assets an invoice or a mortgage is not going to be affected by the course of crypto which allows a stable coin um, like and that collateral just stays much more stable so that's why getting that that type of asset into into there is really interesting. Yep. So um, obviously this depends heavily on underwriting and correct underwriting. How, how do you see, as I understand it, this is now done in a very centralized way, but let's say for invoices, I can easily fire up two legal entities, um, create arbitrary invoices between them, and um, how do you avoid the problem? Yeah. I'm going to go to this slide for a second. Um, so the question is basically how do you avoid faking invoices? Uh, so the cool thing is, like I mentioned in the very beginning, that each of the parties has a public key um, published. So you can basically set up a gate on, on a Tinlake pool and you can say I only accept NFTs where the customer or the supplier or the amount or the currency or whatever kind of field you want, I only accept these kind of in in, in the first place. So, and you can prove that, right? So if there was no signature from either one of these involved parties, then you're not gonna accept that. So we're gonna see, so we're already seeing different pools for right, pools for companies that were like Fortune, uh, Fortune 2000 companies where the customer was that. Uh, so that's one way to, to regulate it. And then also the NFT is getting deposited in the first place. Then the underwriting happens by the pool operator and their incentive is to keep the pool clean because they want to make sure that the assets don't default in there. Uh, so, and only once they underwrite and assess the value of each of the assets, only then the actual lending can happen. And so that underwriting can also be automated, of course, or decentralized, et cetera, et cetera. But there's these two kind of um, um, gates. Can you talk some more about how invoices get paid back? So if someone pays an invoice, where does that money go? How does it actually complete um, the cycle? Yep. Um, so the question is basically, when you pay an invoice back, how does a loan get paid back? Um, so, in, in because Tinlike only deals with NFTs, it doesn't really know it's, is this an invoice or a mortgage or whatever. So there's the there's no direct tie to paying the invoice back. So in this case, it's really a loan to the supplier based on an asset that they can prove is real and valid. So the repayment actually is not c directly tied to kind of the flow of the invoice um, payment, and that's kind of where, like, if you see this, so this flow is is off chain. We do have a way that you can um, basically include payment instructions on this invoice. So you could say, dear customer, please pay me back in DAI. 
But the reality is, and then you can route that die payment to some contract that then repays the loan, for example. But the reality is that the majority of corporates or businesses today, they have no way to pay back and die. So um, that's why that's not there yet. But that's definitely something we would love to do in the future. That's step by step. Um, so this is not replacing QuickBooks or Zero in that sense. It's merely about the um, the sending the data around. So it's not replacing the um, the accounting system. So we have an adapter for SAP, for example, like huge accounting system, invoices getting done there, matched against purchase orders, and all this kind of stuff. And in the end, there is like, okay, we approve this invoice, and that's where like an API call happens to a centrifuge node, and then basically triggers that that communication back and forth. Yeah, in case Then, then the underwriter, so that's similar to what you said, if the invoice is not paid in time, uh, the loan still has to be repaid or the or towards Tim Lake. And if not, then you have starting to have defaulting assets. And I just have a quick time check. Do we have time for one more? Two minutes, yeah, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is what assets are we actually working with today? So the three examples that I mentioned in the very beginning, so invoices, so we have been financing invoices, um, real estate loans, so we have two different real estate platforms basically that underwrite mortgages and using um, DAI in this case as source of capital. And then the last thing is, or one of the other things is the, um, the royalty payments. So that, those are some. And one more. Yeah, uh, part of, uh, part of so it, it's a project that we that we created, and, and it's literally a set of smart contracts that each of the operators deploys themselves. So we're not operating it. Um, that's what they do. We help them, of course, operate it and like explain it to them, um, and so on. Yeah. Sweet. I'm going to end it there just on time. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, find me or anybody else. <laughs>